you for giving me a walk. Can I start by welcoming all of you to Hoban at St Pancras, my constituency. Every MP will tell you their constituency is the best, but this one really is. Uh, and if you're wondering what to do at lunchtime, there's a brilliant set of vegetarian Indian restaurants in Drummond Street just over the road, but welcome you going there uh, to enjoy their food. Can I start by thanking Ivana, uh, Anya, Andrew, and all the staff at Fabian's and FET for today's conference. Uh, to put it mildly, it's well-timed. We often say nobody can foresee um, when there will be crunch moments in the Brexit process. But the fact that the Fabians chose today for this conference, Brexit and Beyond, means they must know something that the rest of us don't. And I look forward to being here next year uh, to see just where we've got to. I, I must say, I was delighted uh, last year to write the foreword to Brexit and Beyond, which was the Fabian pamphlet. Uh, and the point I was making in that forward was that the Brexit debate is too often narrow and process driven. You've seen a lot of that uh, in the last week. Endless discussion about parliamentary process and the institutions of the EU. But it's very light on the causes of the referendum. And one of the things I reflect on um, all the time is that phrase, take back control, which was a Heineken phrase. It really got into people and, and spoke to different aspects of their lives. Uh, and it reminds me uh, that we need to tackle the causes of that fracture in 2016. Inequality, low pay, a broken housing market, and the growing dislocation between our political system uh, and the people who elect us. But it seems the more Parliament has talked about Brexit in the last two years, the less it's cut through to the public. That's why uh, Jeremy Corbyn hit the nail on the head last week when he talked about the common ground and the common grievances between the Leave voter in Mansfield and the Remain voter from Tottenham, on opposite sides of the Brexit divide, but united by being shut out of a system that isn't working for them. And that's the wider task that Labour has to confront, rebuilding Britain as well as finding a Brexit deal that protects jobs and the economy. Now that brings me to last week. I think even by recent standards, an extraordinary week. It was the week that the government proved that it was incapable of delivering a Brexit deal that can unite the country, that can unite Parliament or even unite its own party. The Prime Minister suffered the largest defeat of any government in history. And she did so on the defining issue of this Parliament. Now, in normal times, that would mean a new Prime Minister, a new government. The convention for decades has been that if a government loses a confidence vote, a really important vote, and you don't get much more important what happened on Tuesday, then they go to the country, they recognise the time has come to go to the country. But the Fixed Term Parliament Act dictated otherwise, and these are not normal times. We've got a government that can't govern, a Brexit deal with no chance of going through Parliament, and a Prime Minister who even now refuses to drop the red lines that led to the crisis. People often praise the Prime Minister for her resilience. But what the Prime Minister is doing now is not resilient. It's reckless, ploughing on without a plan whilst the country lurches from one crisis to another. And, and this is crucial, reducing the time for credible alternatives to emerge. Now I'm sure many of you watched proceedings just after 7 o'clock on Tuesday in Parliament and would have seen that when the result was read out, MPs across the House were stunned. We've been taught all day about what the numbers would be. Would it be double digits, possibly triple digits? But a government losing a vote by 230 votes is unprecedented. It's almost inconceivable. No wonder there were just stunned faces. But I wasn't surprised by what happened. I wasn't surprised that the deal was rejected because the seeds 
of Tuesday's vote was sown over the course of the last two years. And it's important that we recognise that. It started with the red lines that the Prime Minister laid out in her 2016 conference speech. Many people will remember the 2017 conference speech with the stage falling down and the P45 and the cough, but it was the 2016 one which was really important. That was the defining speech because that's when the Prime Minister set out her red lines. Out of the customs union, out of the single market, no role for the European Court, and the sentence, if you remember, if you're a citizen of the world, you're a citizen of nowhere. Shame. Quite right. Make no mistake, these were political choices. That was the Prime Minister's interpretation of what had happened in the referendum. She didn't consult on that with Parliament, she didn't consult more widely. This was her narrow, personal interpretation, her red lines. Political choices made by her, not necessities. They set the government down a very bad path. Got the negotiations off to a very bad beginning. I remember going to Brussels just a few weeks after that speech. And our EU27 partners were really shocked that the UK apparently wanted such a rupture from the existing arrangements. They set the government on a path, and it's no surprise where they've now ended. As Michel Barnier said only last week, we have always said that if the UK chooses to shift its red lines in the future, then the EU will immediately be ready to go hand in hand and give a favourable response. But at no point in the last two years has the Prime Minister being prepared to bring Parliament into the process and to help shape the deal that Parliament will be asked to approve. The Prime Minister has set out her Brexit policy through a series of speeches, not votes. Lancaster House, Mansion House, Florence. And so before Tuesday, Parliament's never been asked its view on the basics of the deal. We've never voted on the terms of the deal in all that time in speeches, but no votes. There was no vote on the government's objectives before Article 50 was triggered. No vote on the Chequers plan. No vote on any government white paper or draft text. And I've lost count of the number of reasonable and carefully crafted amendments that were simply voted down by the government. This bullying approach, Parliament must not be able to speak on this deal. There wasn't even closure of information. We discovered the humble address and used it to get impact assessments. The government didn't want us to have those impact assessments. We used it again to seek the advice of the Attorney General. But it wasn't until the government was found in contempt of Parliament that we got it. And we're going through so many historic moments so quickly. Last week, the biggest defeat of any government in history. Just before Christmas, the only government ever to have been found to be in contempt of Parliament. And of course, there was another first. We only had a vote on the triggering Article 50 because the Supreme Court ruled that we had to. The Prime Minister's approach was she do it herself. And we only had a vote last Tuesday because we won the right to do so. The Prime Minister wanted to start the process on her own as an executive act and end it on her own. But for the victory on a meaningful vote, all that would have happened on Tuesday was the Prime Minister making a statement telling us what deal she'd already struck and then answering questions. All of that had to be forced out of her. And my point is, having put Parliament away at every stage, having never been willing to listen to the concerns of Labour and other opposition MPs, it's hardly surprising that when the deal was finally presented, it was flatly rejected. So now we're at a critical juncture, just 69 days uh, until the 29th of March. I do understand and share the growing concern and frustration across the country about the impasse. Plenty of reports 
uh, about that, including one this morning on the Today programme with people from Milton Keynes, this frustration, this concern. And it's hardly surprising after two years of negotiation, because the government's brought back something which is unsatisfactory and hasn't dealt with the deep-rooted causes of Brexit. And the Prime Minister still refuses to take no deal off the table. Make no mistake, when you look back at the last two years, responsibility for where we are lies with this government and this Prime Minister. But, as Andrew pointed out in Labour List last weekend, in this moment of national crisis, Labour has a responsibility not just to oppose, but to offer a constructive path forward. And I agree. It's now time for an open... It's now time for an open and frank debate about how we break the deadlock. In less than two weeks' time, Parliament will be again asked to consider the available options. Tuesday week, the 29th, we look at other options. There are no easy routes out of this mess, and anybody pretends there are is not being honest about the situation we find ourselves in. Difficult decisions are going to have to be made. But now is the time for an honest debate and for credible solutions to emerge. So today I want to set out the path that I believe is available to avoid no deal. Now, it won't surprise anybody here to hear me say that that process starts from the Labour Party conference motion we agreed in September. It took weeks of work over the summer to prepare for that conference and five or six hours locked in a room with 300 Labour Party delegates to arrive at a composite motion. But we did it. We got there in the end. And what we tried to do was to anticipate the decisions that would have to be taken over the next six months and the order in which we would have to take those decisions and set out a clear path as to what we should do. There were, of course, three phases. Phase one, vote down the deal if it doesn't meet our test. That was the first part of the motion. If it doesn't protect jobs, rights in the economy, vote it down. And on Tuesday, that's precisely what we did. And I was really pleased by the unity in the Parliamentary Labour Party when we voted on Tuesday. The unity. There were all sorts of stories over the last few weeks and months about Labour MPs voting this way and that way. The unity was extraordinary at phase one of our party conference when we voted on Tuesday. Phase two, step two in our motion. Seek a general election to sweep away this failed government. On Wednesday, of course, we had a confidence vote, but the Prime Minister clung on. She clung on even though Lest we forget, just before Christmas, 117 of her own party voted no confidence in her. And on Tuesday, 118 Tory MPs voted against her deal. So clinging on was pure party allegiance. Wednesday's vote of confidence, of course, was only the beginning, not the end of our efforts to secure a general election, because securing a general election is and always will be a priority for Labour. After all, it's the only way of delivering a radical change to this country, the radical change that is necessary. But we are now at the third phase of our policy, the phase we anticipated. We're at that phase. Make no mistake about that. And let me, me remind you, this is the phase where our conference policy says if we cannot get a general election, Labour must support all options remaining on the table, including campaigning for a public vote. That was our commitment. It's a very important commitment. It was a commitment to you, to our members, and to our movement. And it's one we must keep. So let me start the exercise as we look at phase three. First, by clearing the decks and ruling out options which we cannot and will not support, and then we can focus on where we really are. First, the Prime Minister's deal, or any tweaked version of it. 
The deal is so flawed, so far from meeting our tests, parliamentary opposition is so great, and the majority of 230 speaks for itself. So I say to the Prime Minister, don't re-present your deal in a week or two or three. It is an option we cannot and will not support. So that option is gone. Option two, no deal is not acceptable. The damage of no deal is so profound that nobody should be casual about it. Labour will never support it. We will do everything to prevent it. And I am convinced that's where the majority is in Parliament. So that's the second option that cannot have any appearance at phase three for us. Third, an option we will reject, a trade deal along the lines of CETA, the Canada model. Not acceptable. That would weaken workplace rights, consumer rights and environmental standards. It wouldn't protect the supply chains that are vital for manufacturing and it wouldn't prevent a hard border in Northern Ireland. So we reject that. Let's clear these options out of the way. That takes me to the fourth option. Any deal that leads to a hard border in Northern Ireland will never be supported by the Labour Party. Never supported by the Labour Party. And I feel very strongly about that. I spent five years working in Northern Ireland with the policing board implementing aspects of the Good Friday Agreement. We should not be casual about what has been achieved in the last 20 years or so, and that option can never be accepted. Now, all four of those options are wrong in principle. They don't need debate over the next few days and weeks. And I don't think they would ever command a majority in the House. So as the Prime Minister goes through the exercise she's going through, she needs to bear in mind those options are never going to get a majority in the House. Let's put them to one side. We're on phase three of our policy. We're looking at the options. So where does that leave us? It leaves us in this situation. There are only really two options we should be considering. Two options. First, instructing the government to negotiate a close economic relationship with the EU. And that needs to take the form of the proposals we put forward, including a comprehensive customs union to protect jobs in the economy, a strong single market deal with alignment and shared institutions, robust rights and standards, and much more ambition in relation to our role in common EU agencies. That's a credible solution to avoid a no deal. It's a close economic relationship. It's a customs union single market proposition that protects our economy. And of course it will protect jobs and rights. And from my conversations in the last two years in Brussels and across the EU 27 countries, I know, and this is the tragedy, that the EU would have considered that option if the UK government had proposed it. But for the red lines we could be a long way down a discussion of what that close economic relationship look like. Be no doubt this approach involves trade-offs and compromises, and it's far from perfect, but it does secure our economy. The second option is, just as our conference motion sets out, the option of a public vote. I know the significant support for this in our membership, in many trade unions, among a number of Labour MPs, and in this city of London. And I don't doubt, most likely, in this hall. So as I sit out in Liverpool, and let me repeat, a public vote has to be an option for Labour. It has to be an option for Labour. After all, deeply embedded in our values are internationalism, collaboration, and cooperation with our European partners. That's what we're about as a party. It's what we've always been about. Now, of course, each of these options has their advocates. There will be impassioned debates in coming weeks about party timing. But we need to recognise that whichever of these options we pursue, the 29th of March looks increasingly unlikely as a deadline to be met. Even if the Prime Minister's deal had passed on Tuesday, there's a huge whole raft of legislation the government would need to get passed. And just to give you some examples, 
a complex implementation bill, an immigration bill, an agricultural and fisheries bill, the trade bill, healthcare bill, financial services bill. 69 days, six bills from start to royal assent. I don't think so. <laughs> Plus 700 statutory instruments that still need to be passed. The Prime Minister can pretend that she could force some of this through with emergency legislation, but she hasn't got a Commons majority. She can't rely on the DUP just to push through legislation. And when a week on Tuesday we vote on other options, there will be just 59 days left to the 29th of March. And that's why I've said and I say again, it seems inevitable to me that the government will have to apply for an extension of Article 50. And that's part of the honesty we need now in the debate as we go forward. So let there be that honesty. Let's identify the credible solutions and not waste time on the ones that are going to get nowhere. We've had two years now. That deal was rejected by the House of Commons. It was rejected the day before by the House of Lords by 169 votes. The biggest defeat of the government on Brexit. It's been rejected by the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh Assembly. Two years have been wasted. Two years with nothing. And so in the coming weeks, Parliament has to take control. And that starts, and this is my core message, with a clear and open and frank discussion about the dilemma we face and honestly about the only credible solutions and choices that are still available. So let's focus on the task ahead at phase three of our policy and recognise the choices we have to make have that discussion and move forward. Thank you very much.